morning, everybody. Oh, it's good. It's kind of now with the feeling of more people here. There's a kind of a different sense. I don't know if you feel that. There's just a sense of arousingness and some of those songs we've just been singing. We're in the presence of the Lord Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. As we come in a little church building in rural Buckinghamshire, it's an amazing reality that we actually are in the presence of God. And God wants to this morning to speak to us. And I find that something just as I prepare, just that's an awesome reality that God wants to speak to every one of us through his spirit, through his word that we come to. I'd just like to greet those people watching online. My name is Jackie and I'm one of the pastors here at Gold Hill. And I'm going to ask you folks online, if you would like to, because it will be helpful, could you go and get yourself a mirror? Particularly if you're watching on your own, it would help if you would have a mirror. Everyone now in the congregation is thinking, oh no, what's she going to do with us? <laughs> but anyway, if you would like to, that would probably be a helpful thing to do. So what we're doing this morning is continuing looking at the book of Ephesians. Last week, uh, Malcolm started a short series. We're looking at over six weeks we're looking at verse 10 of all the different chapters, verse 1, verse 10, 2, verse 10. So today we'll be looking at chapter 2, verse 10. But just a very brief synopsis of what Malcolm spoke about last week, which was in 1, verse 10. He basically took us to help us to see that there's a kind of a London eye view of the gospel that began in that verse. So we heard about how one day everything in history will be put right and under Jesus. And that's something I'm sure in many ways we long for. We long to see the world put right because it certainly isn't right just yet. And he reminded us that on that day, all the questions that you and I might have about why things are as they are, why all the troubles, why all the worldwide difficulties, why the sin impacting so many people. But he was telling us that we know that one day we will get to stand before the throne of God and then those questions won't matter anymore, but we will understand then all the problems and why they happened as they did. But for now, God's purposes are also being worked out through his people now, in this day and age, through his church. We might look at the church of God and think, really? But actually we are the bride of Christ and that is something to remember. We can't see the bigger outworking of his plan often. But Paul writes in this book, more than any other of his letters, to explain the mystery of the church. It's being kind of unveiled. And you need to read the whole book to get the whole feel of that. And obviously, it's one of the things I've done as I've prepared, is read my way through Ephesians. And it just actually, it's really stirring. It's one of the good things about preaching and teaching is you actually read much wider and you actually get caught up in the remarkableness of all the different aspects that Paul is trying to get people to understand as he wrote that letter. He was telling them that um, Jews and Gentiles now need to be seen as one people. And we often would just take that, oh yeah, Jews and Gentiles. But that for them was absolutely revolutionary. They were very separate groupings of people in their world. And Paul was saying, no, it's now all one. We are all one in the church. I mean, today we're focusing, as I said, on Ephesians 2, verse 10. And it's one that also we can skim over and not really get the richness of it. So I'm hoping that through my explanation and through the Spirit of God working in you today, you'll see more about what God is saying to you, to us. So the verse says this, For we are what God made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Now, in the NIV, it writes it slightly different. You'll be able to pick up the slight different nuances. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So a sense of handiwork. New Living Translation takes up a slightly different one. We are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew, in Christ Jesus, so that we can do all the good things he planned for us long ago. So within each of those translations, we get a different part. We get the created and recreated, if you are a Christian. 
We are God's handiwork, and we've been made a masterpiece. Now, would you like to turn to a person next to you, and if you're watching online, this is when you need your mirror, and say to, your, to each other, you are God's masterpiece, you are his handiwork. Would you like just to say that to each other? So do you believe it? Do you believe that is true? Are you convinced of that? Or do you look at the person next to you and think, what, you? <laughs> or maybe they just looked at you and said the same. But you should, seriously. This is what the scripture tells us. You are God's masterpiece. You are his handiwork. Now, I expect that you have um, heard this particular um, psalm before this verse are we on it says for it was for it was you that's God who formed my inward parts you knit me together in my mother's womb I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made wonderful are your works we are all the product of the master creator's hand and he doesn't drop stitches when he is knitting. I love that, you know, the knitted together in our mother's womb. Here's another one from Isaiah. You are our father, we are the clay, you are the potter, and all of us are the work of your hands. Now you might wish you looked differently, but who are we to say that the master creator got it wrong? There are no duff people in God's handiwork. And every time he created one person, that mold got broken because he only wants one of you, one of me. He doesn't want us to be like somebody else. Now let's have a look at what some people might consider to be a masterpiece. And I should be now asking all you art people, do you know? Ooh, do you know who that is? Somebody muttered? Rembrandt, it is. Rembrandt at age 23. This one. Anybody know who that is? I'm hearing Van Gogh, but it's not. It is actually the same person, just older. At this age, this one, he is age 59. The first one, he was age 23. He painted lots of himself. Now we might think, well, that sounds very egotistical. But actually, it seems that he painted himself about 50 or so times self-portraits. And he was an artist who didn't try to hide the blemishes. If you look at that picture, there's lots of creases and wrinkles. And he's not exactly looking too happy. But he used his own kind of looking at himself as he painted himself because he was actually thinking about himself. And what was inside? Was it shown through what was outside. Maybe that would say he's not a particularly happy man. He actually started off his life, he had family and he was a happy man and then things went wrong for him as his children, there were different things happened to them. But he was a man who did not hide from actually showing the whole of what he looked like. Now within our culture today, I think there are so many influences that tell us about that you've got to look youthful, got to look perfect. Do you see those things? From the surgeons who lift up, smooth up, smooth out, plump up various parts of the body. Because people are always wanting themselves to look different to what they are looking like already. The cosmetic industry sells its products based on the need to look younger. The creams, I looked online to see what they're all called, they're great names, so you get the anti-aging wrinkle smoothing cream, you get the facial rejuvenating, the wrinkle eye reducer, the atrophilin, which sounds too much like polyfill to me, <laughs> or there's even the wonder lift. Now I'm not saying that these things don't do what they say they do, maybe, but my question is why is it as people that we want to look? different to how we do. There are so many voices out there in our society through advertising, through um, television, 
It's all about looking a certain way. And it's very difficult, I think, to push back those voices when we don't actually almost notice that they're there speaking to us because they come in all sorts of different ways and guises. But we need an antidote. And the verse that we're looking at today is a part of that antidote because we need to stop seeing us as other people might say. Now, I look at um, how some of the people on, in the media, I've got two photographs you'll see side by side. One's the real thing, and one's what you look like or their person looked like after they were photoshopped. Do you know who that person is? Harry Styles. Apparently, he's a singer in One Direction. I had to ask the younger people for that. But there, you know, he's got some facial blemishes, but he still looks like a nice guy. But no, he's got to be smoothed out, wrinkle-free. This one, it's less obvious, Jennifer Aniston. But all the wrinkles in her forehead and face, they've all been smoothed out for that purpose. And I think that's very sad that these people, who I think already look rather lovely, feel the need to be looking differently. Or the media says that that's how they need to portray them. So we need a truth that will really fill us up so that we can sing back to our culture from a different song sheet. Head held high. A world that we have a worth that is different to the, what, what, what the world may say. This verse tells us that we are the workmanship of God. Breathe that in. You are the workmanship of God. The great potter, who's the master potter, you're made by him. He did the knitting in your mother's womb. Now, the word used for workmanship is one in Greek called poema, which is also used one other time in the Bible, in Romans 1.20, when Paul there is talking about the creation of God. But here, this is the new poema, the new creation, the product of the artisan's hands, the master designer. Before conversion, our lives didn't have the same balance that they should have now. We now have a symmetry and an order if God's spirit is at work in us. We are ordered in a different way internally as his spirit works in us. Timothy Keller, who some of you may have read or heard about, he is a theologian, he's in America. He says, do you know what it means that you are God's workmanship? What is art? Art is beautiful. Art is valuable and art is an expression of the inner being of the maker, of the artist. Imagine what that means. You're beautiful, you're valuable, and you're an expression of the very inner being of the artist, the divine artist, God himself. So part of God he made into you in so that his image is in you. God could be saying, I'm the artist, you're the art. I'm the painter. You're the canvas. I'm the sculptor. You're the marble. You don't look like much there in the quarry, but I can see. Oh, I can see. Those are Tim Keller's words. I love that image of being stone in the quarry. If we think of a piece of stone, it's like God can see the image he is crafting beforehand. We would just look at it and maybe see ourselves as a bit of old rock. But if God is the craftsmanship, then it's going to be beautiful come the end of it. And we are a work in progress. Remember the t-shirts. If you don't think much of me, don't worry. God hasn't finished with me yet. He hasn't finished with any of us. We are still a workmanship under construction. But by his spirit, he already sees us as he sees Jesus. Now, I know that my saying this or Timothy Keller saying this doesn't make this necessarily real. We do need God's spirit to let this land within us, to be our truth. I was thinking about how a cow eats and chews on something over and over, and then it goes down to his stomach and it ruminates, goes round and round to get out all the nutrient of it. We need to let the rumination of God's work land in us so that we can live out of this. Do you like to just shut your eyes and I'm gonna ask God's spirit to let this become true. Holy Spirit, we know you are here. 
We long to see ourselves like you see us. You know how we often look at ourselves. We need that old way to fall off us so that we can receive the truth that we are crafted by you, made by you, valuable to you. Please come amongst us now to help us to see that's true. Ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, wholeness comes when we see ourselves with the value God puts on us. To get a greater clarity, I'm just going to read the context that Paul put around that verse so that we can see it more fully. In chapter 2, starting at verse 2, he wrote, You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it's the gift of God, not the result of work, so that no one can boast, for we are what he has made us created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. He tells them that before they had been turned into this masterpiece, they had been dead, spiritually dead. Paul explains to his readers that they may have had healthy bodies, lively minds, attractive personalities, but their souls were dead. And as people with dead souls, they were completely unable to respond to God. But the situation was even worse than that. They were not only spiritually condemned, uh, dead, but they were condemned to an eternity without God because God's anger was directed against that sin. Now, we can often minimize the effect of sin, but it can't be a small thing. If the only way for it to be dealt with was with God becoming man, dying in our place. Sin messes things up so badly so that all the good and natural desires that God has put within us become warped and exaggerated. So hunger becomes greed and sexual attraction becomes lust, those sorts of things. But then, the passage moves on, then we get the miracle. God had mercy on us, the corrupt, captive, helpless race. Yay! Alongside God's wrath was God's love. He, was the, he has the power to intervene, the power to save us from all that that was dead. Paul's teaching about salvation is that it is by God's action alone. We can't do it. And so Paul is so keen to let them know that God wants them to see this undeserved gift of salvation because he wants them not to boast about their own way of doing things. So to get a full message across, they needed to remind, be reminded of how bad things had been so they could appreciate the wealth of the gift they had received. So if I just go through that, if we look at these slides, what we were, we were spiritually dead. You were followed the ways of the world, under the rulership of the kingdom of the air, 
We may not all understand that, but basically it means we were not within God's domain in the same way. You were under God's wrath. Children of wrath. But then what we are, you, they were, what we are now, if we are followers of Jesus, we're spiritually alive. In a relationship with Christ, seated with Christ in a heavenly realm. That, that stuff blows my mind. We are already, because of Jesus, in as much as until we get there to heaven, we won't see the fullness of it. But we are within the riches of God's heaven. They were recipients, receivers of God's mercy, love and kindness. So are we. Saved by grace. Paul had said in just a few verses before, in chapter 118, that he'd been praying for them. Isn't it lovely when you know people are praying for you? I know that Trevor earlier today said to me he was so thankful for the prayers of God's people because he is now healthy, having been really unwell. Even as the prayer group came out, they came and said to me, we've really been praying for you. There's a sense of, wow, that's lovely when you know people are praying for you. But what had Paul been praying for them? I think this is quite important. He says he's praying for them constantly, asking God the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called. His holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. He wants us to be hopeful people. It's not all negative at all. It's that we are now hopeful people because of what God has done. I also pray, he goes on, that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. And seated him in the place of honour at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. That sounds remarkable if you just let that sink in. A hope that's based on what God has already done by having Jesus come to us on earth. And we, as we accept his death as our own, we're now seen as holy people who belong to him. Can you grasp that? So turn to the person next to you, people online, look in your mirror and say to the person next to you, you are a holy man or woman of God and are part of God's family. <laughs> he promises to give us great power do you feel like a powerful person? I'm imagining like myself often, no, you probably don't feel like a powerful person. Well, it's not your power, you'll be glad to know. It's God's power in you. How great is that power? Unbelievably great. I think we don't really grasp it because we often just don't see it in action in, in very often. It's the same power that raised Christ from dead, death to life. That power by the Holy Spirit is in you and me. So now, look at the person next to you and say, within you is God's power. Say it with conviction. I think we have become so familiar with this language that we've stopped seeing how remarkable it is. You are God's workmanship with God's power in you. Wow. Let me ask you a question. How many of you enjoy either telling your testimony or hearing testimonies? Do you enjoy those? Yes, I do too. Maybe you've heard or maybe your story is one of those sort of before options, you know, it was all awful sort of drug selling, killing sort of person to no longer, <laughs> probably not. But maybe you have seen people or you've read stories of people who have been completely changed by meeting God. When I was at Spring Harvest just a few weeks ago, I heard a story of a man who um, works with people who are people who live on the streets. And uh, they come into this place in Manchester where they were um, given jobs to do. 
And they've so understood that they are changed because their lives are no longer the same anymore. And he observed one of them going out onto the street on New Year's evening and talking with other people who were on the streets and telling him about Jesus. And then they came back afterwards and they were kind of just talking about their evening. Many people obviously being caroling, uh, cajoling and drinking, but this guy who'd had his life changed had gone out and told people about Jesus. And five people in Manchester that night gave their life to Jesus because he had been able to tell them his story. So it gave them a sense, this is real, this is true. We sometimes think our story is kind of quite minimal. No, it's not that exciting. Really, is God at work in me? Yes, he is. We don't need one of those amazing big stories because as we've just heard, he tells them, and it was true of you and me, you were dead before you became a believer, spiritually dead. Reminds me of the Monty Python sketch, but I decided not to go there. <laughs> So we were not alive. We were not able to respond until the Holy Spirit came and lived within us. Then we are made alive. But God didn't want people like that because of his love. Just like that guy in Manchester, it was when he understood he had been so loved and changed, it just made him want to tell other people. So next time someone asks you, why are you a follower of God? What's your story? You could say, I was dead. I was heading towards an eternal awfulness. But God came and intervened and has given me new life. He's created me to be a masterpiece. And they'll probably look at you and think, right. <laughs> but that is all our testimony. We were dead. But then we must be careful that once we've received that gift, we then don't think, oh, it's all up to me now to do this. I've got to do the good works because Paul says, no, it's about grace even in doing the good works. It's not you that does them. It is by his initiation, but you need to be like the soft potter's clay and he makes the good works come from you. Last week, I was reading a quote um, from Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby. He was talking about grace. He said, grace is the most beautiful word in the language of God. It means love given freely and without expectation of return. That's lovely. Or another man, Charles Swindle, wrote, every time the thought of grace appears, there is the idea of it being undeserved. In no way is the recipient getting what he or she deserves. Favor is being extended simply out of the goodness of the heart of the giver. So the giver is God. Out of his heart, he wanted us to know him, to be changed by him for his purposes as the church. And so that brings us back to the verse that we're looking at. To the final part that says, you have a God-given role to play within his work. Now, if you look around this church, you are not dead people now. You're alive people your living masterpieces, which God's breathed his life into you so that you can go and do his works. What are these good works? Well, they can be all sorts. If we look in 1 Corinthians, we know there are different gifts he gives to people. So he doesn't want us to look like each other. One of the negative things sometimes of uh, uh, a Christian community, as in any community, is that we start looking at other people's gifts and thinking, I want to be like that. I want to be able to do what that person does. Recently, I was up uh, with the live group, one of the youth groups, and they were asking me questions about my life. And they said at the end, what would be the one thing you would want us as young people to know? And I said, be the best you you can be. Stop looking around and trying to be somebody else and let God use you where you are, who you are, your personality, what you look like, let you be you. Because God broke the mold after he made you because he didn't want to, he just wanted you. Now, sometimes God uses us for all sorts of different tasks. And once again, in our culture, we might emulate certain tasks more than others because we're kind of a 
culture that looks at fame and famous people, we often look at the, the rock star images, those who are up on the big screens, who seem to have a loud voice, and we think, oh, they've really got it together. But I really think that's just so wrong. Part of my role is I go over to Rock House, and I see the way the carers there look out for each, each of the old people, caring for dementia people. That is such a task. It's just beautiful to see the way they love them. And wherever we are, whatever our job is, God wants to empower you to do it more fully. So that can be anything from praying for people. Nobody else might know you ever do that. But if God puts you in your heart to pray for a particular people, people group, my husband works within Wycliffe and we worked in, for the Sudanese. So we have a heart for the Sudanese people. They're going through a dreadful time right now because of their hunger, because there's a famine. God might ask you to pray for a particular people group. He might ask you just to say hello to people as you walk down the streets, because everybody can do that. So ultimately, as God's workmanship, listen for his voice. Don't try to be another person. Don't be proud or arrogant of what you do, but actually just enjoy being who you are. He wants you to enjoy the life he has given you. He doesn't want you to feel like, oh, I'm not supposed to because lots of other people are having a hard time. The poor will always be amongst you, Jesus said. Yes, they are, and we are called to care for the poor and the needy. But we're also called to enjoy the richness of the lavishness of the grace that he has given us so that we can show, like Paul was a joyful person, we can be joyful people. Sometimes I think Christians look very somber, a bit like the Rembrandts. But actually, let's be people who could go out into our community and know we are masterpieces built for a purpose. You and me, created in God's image for God's work. We are God's masterpieces designed to carry out good works in his love. So it's a simple message, yet I think it's a profound one. That it changes us. As a, before I became as a role in, in, uh, as a pastor, I was a counsellor for many years. And one of the things I saw within people and within myself, I put myself there too, is that so often we look down on ourselves. Our self-esteem, our view of ourselves can be so low that we don't actually see and lift our face up to see what God would make us to see of ourselves. And I believe that ultimately the longer we spend looking at Jesus, seeing what he was like, seeing who he is, seeing what he's called us to be, then we become more like him. So as you spend time this week in God's word, praying, asking God to help you to see the masterpiece that he's crafting, you become more like him. And that's a wonderful thing. Could you all stand with me, please? Paul wrote, as I read out to you, what his prayer was for the people, that their eyes, their hearts would be flooded with light. So I'm going to ask you, just as a symbol, put your hand on your heart, and I'm going to pray for us that we will hear this, see this. Father God, I pray, as Paul prayed, that we would have your spiritual wisdom and insight so that we would grow in our knowledge of you, that our hearts will be flooded with light so that we can understand the confident hope that you have given us because you have called us to be holy people. It's by your presence in us that we understand this, Father. So Holy Spirit, come and enable us to see us as you see us and to enjoy being what, who you have made us to be. Amen.